He's the malware analysis lead at Inviso and a senior handler at the Internet Storm Center. Uh, Inviso out of Belgium, really great company, grown up to like over 100 people working there now, really, really smart folks. Um, he's the author of over 100 open source forensics tools, including famous ones like OLE Dump. So, you know, I think hey, I've got a few open source tools here and there. He's got over 100. So fantastic contributor out there, um, a Microsoft MVP for many, many years. He's presented, I believe, at every single BrewCon that has occurred thus far. And I was told apparently by uh, Eric Van Bugenaut, who's a, a friend of both of ours, that he enjoys uh, rock climbing. I'm just trying to figure out when you can actually have time for rock climbing, Didier, but I'll let you share that information. But thank you for joining at such a late time in your time zone. And his talk is titled Maldocs Tips for Red Teamers. Hey, Steve. Thanks for the nice introduction. And, uh, and one thing, you, you talk about more than 100 uh, tools. Uh, those are the public tools, okay? I, I also have, uh, well, quite some private tools that I, that I don't uh, publicize. Okay, so let's get started with this. So this talk is all, all about malicious documents and, and particularly uh, for Office. Huh? So if you're expecting something else, you're in the wrong talk. So as uh, Steve said, uh, I'm Didier Stavis, and I develop a lot of uh, open source tools. If you have ever taken a class uh, for on, uh, on the defensive side, eh, uh, as a blue teamer, for example, reverse engineering at Sense, then you have encountered my tools, uh, like uh, OLE dump, uh, PDF parser, PDF ID, uh, things like that. So I'm a senior expert at uh, Enviso. It's a company located in Belgium and in Germany. And I'm also a handler at the uh, Internet uh, Storm Center. So I'm going to start with a quick intro uh, for the uh, Office uh, file format. Then I'll have, uh, sorry, a couple of tips for you. The main uh, part of this talk here will be examples, a lot of examples with, with some disclosures. Uh, for example, at the, at the end, I will do an example where I do some tampering with the digital signature of an uh, office document. Uh, so the digital signature of the VBA code of an office document. And at the end, I can take uh, questions and I will also be uh, in the Slack room. So like I said, this is all about malicious office documents and that's the reason of the slides here and also in particular i'm only going to talk about macros okay so nothing about uh, exploits uh, uh, binary exploits not considering that this talk is only about uh, macros that you will encounter in office documents uh, like the famous yellow ribbon here that you have so the file format. There are many file formats supported by Microsoft Office. So if you open Word or if you open Excel and you have done save as, as save as your document, then you will see a, comp a long list, uh, 20, maybe 20 more uh, types of documents that, that you can save. Now there are two major uh, types. You have the Office Open XML type, uh, the OOXML. So, and it's Office Open. It's not Open Office now. It's Office Open. That's Microsoft, huh? and that type is mainly a zip container with XML files inside, huh? and sometimes a bit more, depending on what you have in your document. Uh, for example, if you have uh, pictures, then you will have PNG or JPEG files inside. If you have macros, then you will have a, a binary file with macros. And those documents, they typically end with extension docx, docm, xlsx. Next one is the compound file binary format. This is the old format. So the new format uh, was introduced with Office 2007. So that's quite uh, some time ago. The old format is still very popular. That's the one with .doc and .xls. That's a binary file format. And uh, okay, it's it has several names, uh, compound file rebuy format. I like to call this the uh, OLE format because it is related to uh, object linking and embedding. And that also explains the, the, the name of my tools like OLEDump. 
Now, one thing to remember about that binary file format is that it is a file system in itself. So this is a representation of the content of such a binary file. Here it is called the structure storage compound file. And you have a tree structure with folders and files. Folders are called storages and files are called streams. So that's a takeaway uh, just for the two file formats, uh, XML in zip and binary. Now I'm going to share you tips, a couple of tips that I have for red teamers. And, and let it be clear, I'm not, uh, I'm not a red teamer, I, I'm not a pen tester. Hmm? But uh, we have red teamers and pen testers in, in uh, our company. And I assist them often uh, by creating uh, special programs or uh, special documents. So the first tip that I have is analyze your stuff. Okay, so let's say that you uh, have a target, a client, and you want to send them a malicious document that you created, uh, deploy uh, a document for them. Now, when I say analyze your stuff, I don't mean test your stuff. What I mean is look at your document like a blue team would do, like an analyst would do, because you might be surprised by some stupid mistakes that you can do by not uh, taking a close look at your documents. And that's something that I will show in the examples. Next thing is uh, to learn from uh, actors. When it comes to malicious documents, there are many actors involved with uh, malicious documents. Um, we have the, the red teamers and the best pen testers, and then blue teamers analysts uh, like myself. But you also have the, the real malware out, so the criminals. Uh, you have researchers. You have uh, APT groups. Um, you have state agencies. A lot of people are involved with the analysis and the creation and research of malicious documents. So my second tip is that you learn from those actors, either because they publish um, analysis uh, reports or either that they res uh, publish research or that you just obtain malicious documents from them and that you do the analysis. Next thing, very important, I do that all the time, when it comes to hacking, when it comes to research, uh, it's to read the fine manual and, and use it. Huh? So also I'm going to show this with examples. Uh, if you read the documentation of Microsoft, when it comes to my office documents, there's a lot to learn. Not only use it, but also abuse it. So really hacking. And that's what I'm going to show uh, with the examples. So let's get started here uh, with the examples. So what I uh, often do in uh, my presentations is to do the uh, demos, demonstrations, live demos. Huh? But here in this, this context, uh, I prepared everything with slides. So I have a lot of screenshots here uh, in the examples. So let's get started with the first example. Here uh, you have the title of uh, the example, the power of strings and the tip to which it pertains. Uh, here, analyze your stuff. So what are you seeing here? You're seeing a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet with Office 4, uh, sorry, Excel 4 macros. Excel 4 macros are very popular. They predate VBA. They were released somewhere in the late 90s. Uh, that's when this uh, technology came available. And for the moment, it is very popular because it uh, can be uh, used to uh, bypass detection like antivirus. Uh, many antiviruses are not that good for the moment at detecting Excel 4 macros. So what is the thing about Excel 4 macros? Well, all your formulas or your statements, you have to put them inside a cell in your spreadsheet. And here, I just have a, a very small program that displays a message box with a URL, uh, example.com. But that URL is not in clear text. It's sophisticated. That's something that, of course, you want to do. You don't want your uh, IOCs, like URLs, to be uh, easily uh, recovered uh, because either that could uh, trigger detection or uh, an analyst might be easily uh, recovering the IOCs from your uh, document. So what I did here is make a formula with uh, a car, uh, car 
function. So that converts a number into an ASCII. And then this is all concatenated together. And that gives me the HTTPS example. Uh, so when I run this program, this string is generated here. Then the next step is the execution of the alert. The alert is the message box. The alert reads the string that is in cell A1, displays it. Then when I click OK, I go to the next step, the halt, and I stop. Okay. Now, I'm taking a look here at this spreadsheet. So I saved this at, uh, in the old file format, XLS. And I'm just using the strings command. Huh? So the, the strings tool is a tool that will just look for clear text uh, strings, uh, ASCII or um, uh, Unicode. Huh? And OK, here I use my own tool, but um, that's not uh, important. You could use just any strings tool. Huh? And then you grab for HTTP. And as you can see here, your URL, even though you have obfuscated, your URL is just present in clear text in that file. So that makes analysis really easy. And that's something that I often recommend uh, to analysts. Uh, do a strings command. Uh, just look what kind of strings uh, you can recover, especially if you are using PowerShell commands with base64 inside it. Then a strings command, if it's in clear text, will recover your complete command. So that's not good. It's something we want to avoid. Now, where is this string uh, located exactly? Inside the workbook. So here I'm using my tool, OLEDUM, to analyze this document. And it gives me this list. This is a list of different streams that are inside this document. I remember the old file format storages, streams. This here contains a stream. Then here, next one, I will use a Yara rule. A Yara rule searching for the string HTTP. Sorry, a Yara rule searching for the string HTTP. And as you can see, it triggers on the workbook stream. Uh, so that uh, string HTTPS example.com is inside the workbook. Hmm? And the workbook contains a lot of records that ma make up your spreadsheet. Hmm? And there is a record in there for the formula, so my car concatenation. But right after that uh, record, there is also a record that is a cache that contains the string, the string that is all already calculated. Eh? So that's done for performance reasons. The, the string is stored in there, and that's why it is uh, there. Eh? So it's something you, you want to get rid of. Eh? You could, for example, remove that record, but that's not something I'm going to cover. Eh? In my second uh, analysis, I'm going to focus on my second tip, and that is to, to learn from the actors, eh? what are actors doing. Eh? And one of the things that was done in the beginning when uh, Excel 4 macros became popular is that we saw that actors, and I don't know who really started with this, uh, could be a good guy, uh, could be a bad guy, I don't know. But what we saw was the following. So I have here my uh, spreadsheet, uh, quite similar to the, the other one. And uh, because it's very large, I, I split it over two parts. So let me move this out of the way. OK. So here, as you can see, here 104, 116, and so on. This is the expression that we already had. And so this generates our formula, uh, sorry, our uh, IOC, the URL. Now, this URL will not be stored in cell A1. What will happen, because of the formula, uh, function together with the second argument is a5 when this formula is evaluated the actual string will be written here in cell a5 and then you have your alert your message box that will read it from a5 and then stopping okay so let's see what this gives like this so you see that the string now appears in cell A5 and that the message box is displayed. 
And if we run a strings command now on the example, the second example, and grab for HTTP, there is no output. So that um, record, that record that contains the, the cache string uh, now uh, doesn't exist because for that case here, because the expression is encased inside the formula uh, function. And so that partial expression is not uh, cached. Now, of course, you can still uh, analyze this if you have the skills. And that's what I'm just illustrating here with my tool Ole Dump and with uh, my plugin BIFF. BIFF is the file format, the old file format that is used for Excel. So what I use, plugin options, C, and this will give me uh, a list of all the formulas. As you can see here, I've extracted the formula. And then I can run this through another of my tools, numbers to string, that will just do the conversion. And here you see the URL. Huh? Of course, you do obfuscation. But if it's simple obfuscation, it's something that can be easily recovered. OK. Now here, uh, a third example. Hmm? And this is about reading the, the manual and, and using what you read in this manual. Now, you have here a sheet. This is the macro sheet. And this macro sheet can actually be hidden. So if you right click here on that sheet, you have an option hide. And if you hide this, then the sheet is no longer present. Well, no longer visible. It is still present, uh, but it is uh, no longer visible. And if you have an analyst that will uh, do the analysis of the, the document with Excel, I open it, for example, in a virtual machine with, with Excel, then um, the analysis will be a bit more difficult for this analyst because this analyst will have to unhide the sheet. Okay. Now, if I run my OLED dump tool on this document uh, that I created, again with my BIFF uh, plugin, and I search for particular records, namely records that are bound sheets. I see that I have two sheets, macro one and sheet one. One is an Excel 4 macro sheet and it is hidden. The other one is a worksheet or a dialogue sheet and it is visible. Now next here, I add an extra option A. The, the A does an ASCII and hexadecimal dump so that you can see the content of the record. And if you look here at the record now, so we have our name of the, um, of the sheet, macro one, sheet one. This is represented here. And this is ASCII. And that is why that byte value is zero here. If it's Unicode, that byte value will be one. And uh, the six here is the length of the sheet. Okay, so this both sheets are six records long. This byte here is the type of the sheet. So zero is a worksheet, one is an Excel 4 macro sheet. And then finally, the last byte I'm going to talk about is this byte here, byte one or zero. This is the visibility. And so it is visible or hidden. Now, that is something you can uh, discover, but you can also read about this in the Microsoft documentation. Eh? And going to uh, document MS OVBA, uh, it contains uh, all kinds of uh, documentation about VBA. And this one here, if I'm not mistaken, is MS XLS uh, about the binary XLS uh, format. And I included the URL here at the bottom. So. This is the bound sheet record. And here you have a graphical representation of that record. And here you have a field A. Field A is the state. Huh? It specifies the hidden state of a sheet. So this is the, what I call the visibility. And it is composed of two bits. And if you read here, you can see that value zero is visible and value one is hidden. Okay, But you have a third value. Uh, value two. Value two is very hidden. Very hidden means that the sheet is hidden and it cannot be displayed using the user interface. So you cannot do unhide. So what do I do? 
I know the position here of this byte value. I open this in an uh, hexadecimal uh, editor and I replace that value with value zero two to make it very hidden. By the way, you can also do this programmatically in VBA, um, but here, okay, I just did it with an hexadecimal editor because, yeah, I like to use hexadecimal editors. And the other one has not changed. And as you can see here, the state now is very hidden. And now if you go back to Excel and you try to unhide this, as you can see, that's no longer possible. It is great to that option. And that is because you're dealing with a very hidden sheet. Now, that very hidden sheet, you can make this visible again, uh, just for example, with uh, a tool or with an hexadecimal editor or with the VBA code. And you go to uh, your the VBA editor environment, you take the instant uh, console and then you type a line or two to, to change the status of that sheet and then you can make it uh, visible again. Now, what I talked about here, and let me just make one change, okay. What I talked about here huh, was reading the manual and using it. Huh? So we looked into the manual and we saw that we also have a value two. Hmm? Now here in my uh, example number four, we're going to go a step further. We're going to abuse this. You see here we have values zero, one and two. And this is two bits. Now, if you're familiar with uh, binary data, and I hope uh, that you are, when you have two bits, you have four possible values. So we can actually have zero, we can have one, we can have two, and we can also have three. And three is not documented. So that's something, of course, that I want to test out. Sorry. So like I said, that's something that I want to test out. And so with my tool again, I locate the position and then I change that value uh, from uh, zero, for example, where it is visible to three. And this is something that you can only do uh, with an hexadecimal editor, for example. Uh, you cannot use VPA code here to, to assign that value three, that, that will not work. And my tool here, uh, here will uh, warn you. It will tell you, okay, the visibility is three. So let's see what happens when we open this document. Okay, so you get a warning. And uh, I did not uh, set the uh, mark of the web bit on this document. So this document is not downloaded uh, from the internet or by email. I just saved it to the, to the disk. But still, uh, instead of receiving your yellow warning for uh, macros, now we are seeing a protected view warning. Huh? So Office has detected a problem with this file. Editing may harm your computer. Click for more details. Okay. So, okay, that's not really what we want. Huh? So we, we wanted to uh, mislead uh, analyst or uh, antivirus uh, detections. Hmm? And yeah, here we are actually uh, ending up with a document that will be harder for the end user to open. And because you have a protected view, you have to click here and then you get this view and then you have to click here, edit anyway, okay? And then if you are in edit anyway, then you have your yellow ribbon so that you can enable macros. And this here uh, illustrates also a, a point that is not often uh, discussed uh, when it comes to, to research, and, and that's unfortunate. When you do research, when you hack, when you try things out, a lot of things will fail. Uh, uh, expect that a lot of things that you will try out, they will not work. They will uh, flat out fail, uh, like this here, okay? so. If I enable macros, this will run. And so, okay, the, the, the file is a bit corrupt for Excel, but still the macros will, won't run, uh, will run. The Excel 4 macros will execute. But for the end users, this is not a good situation and because he will have more alerts. 
And if you look at research, uh, for example, also things that I post uh, on, on my blogs, it's always about things that w have worked, things that uh, were successful. And you rarely see things that, that fail. And, and that is also interesting to know, huh? because now it, I don't think that this here uh, was, was ever published, eh? but, but by talking about this, I at, ne at least share the knowledge that, okay, you don't have to go that way. Eh? Don't try out that value tree because, okay, it works, but you will have that extra uh, alert. Now, I have not said uh, a thing about the title here, very, very hidden. Why did I give this uh, name? to this example is because of the following. I have found a sample like this on VirusTotal. Right? So by hunting on VirusTotal with uh, dedicated Yara rules, I found a sample where somebody tried that out. And the name of the file that that person had uh, given to that uh, spreadsheet was very, very hidden. Okay, So that's uh, a third state, very, very hidden, uh, as that person calls it. But it's actually not something that uh, can be very useful. Now, uh, example five. I'm coming back to my barn sheet and we are uh, continuing further uh, on our journey to hack this, to, to abuse this. So we tried out all the possible values uh, for two bits. Now this variable, this field A, is inside this byte here. And you can see next to this byte is set unused. Unused, six bits, undefined and must be ignored. So you have six bits there that are unused and uh, undefined. Typically they are zero, but let's try out what happens if we change them to something else. So I did this here, uh, and again, you can see the output with uh, my OLED dump tool. Here you have the value for the visibility, and the two uh, is very hidden, but there also is also a one. So uh, I changed one of the bits. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the uh, third, third least significant bit of, uh, of that value of those reserved bits. As you can see, my tool here says, okay, this is uh, very hidden, but the reserved bits uh, are not zero. And if we open this, there is no warning at all. Well, I mean, no extra warning. Eh? You just have the security warning. You can enable macros. And when you enable macros, uh, code is executed. So that is something uh, that you can try out, uh, a change that you can make. Now, why would you want to make this? Well, you, you would want to do this if you are in a situation where you know that this can help you to bypass detection. Like, for example, if you have to bypass uh, specific tools that look for the value, values of those bytes, like these example Yara rules that I have here. So uh, this rule here is an, uh, a Yara rule for Excel 4 macros, uh, ASCII sheet name that are hidden, and here for ASCII that is very hidden. And as you can see here, the bound sheet macro for ASCII, this value needs to be one for this rule to trigger, uh, hidden, and the value here needs to be two for this rule to trigger, uh, very hidden. Now you can understand where I'm going. If you change one of the bits, then this value is no longer two or one. Uh, it's another value like 12, and those rules will no, no longer trigger. Uh, so by changing those uh, unused bits, you have created a, a spreadsheet that is still valid, that will still execute your payload, but it might uh, bypass detection by certain tools that look for those uh, bytes. Now, I also looked for this on VirusTotal, and this is the Yara rule that I used. And as you can see here, I'm not looking for a specific value. I'm looking for any byte value, uh, uh, question mark, question mark. And then in the condition itself, I will 
convert this to a number, this byte, sorry, this byte I will convert this to a number, and this rule will trigger is this, if this number is larger than two. Uh, so if it is zero uh, normal, uh, visible, one hidden or two very hidden, it will not alert, but if it is the other uh, possibility, uh, one of the unused bits that is set or uh, very, very hidden, this rule will trigger. And again, I have observed actors on VirusTotal that are testing with this. Huh? Not only doing tests, but I also saw that they modified a Zloader uh, spreadsheet. And there have been a lot of Zloader malicious documents recently. Well, they changed one of those documents to change all of the, those values. And they tested out all the values. That, uh, so we have six bits, that's 64 bit, uh, 64 combinations. They test them, they, them all out. So up till now, we talked about Excel 4 macros, uh, something very popular. And I gave you examples of the different tips um, and the reason why you might do that, eh, to throw off the analysis or make uh, detection harder. Now we are going to look with the three last uh, examples, we are going to look at VBA code. And I'm going to start with uh, VBA stomping, uh, something that is uh, very well known. Um, in 2016, um, Veselin Bonchev, I got in touch with uh, Veselin Bonchev, who is a, an antivirus uh, researcher, and he shared with me a, a very small uh, office document that he had uh, created. And that document, when you looked at the code, you didn't see any code. But when you opened the document, it displayed a message box, this could be a virus, okay? And that's all that there was to it. Eh? Veselin Bonchet is not the kind of person that will uh, explain um, how, those, how he created that uh, malicious document uh, because he fears that then this could be uh, abused. But uh, I, I was able to figure out uh, what he had done back then. And uh, Veselin Bonchev also started to make tools to, to deal with this. And what we have here is that I created a, a VBA document. I added a module and I just put in auto open message box, again, example.com here in this document. And if you run this document, of course, yeah, the, the message box is displayed. Um, uh, nothing really special here. Now in 2018, um, the thing that happened is that there were a couple of talks uh, um, by the guys of uh, Artflank, uh, for example, in the, in the Netherlands, and also the, the red team of uh, Walmart uh, in the US, they, they talked about this. And they called this technique uh, VBA stomping. And what is going on is, is the following. In a classic normal VBA, uh, document with VBA code, you have at least two uh, types of code. You actually have the source code and you have the compiled code. And VBA stomping is the practice of doing away with the source code and just keeping the compile code and hoping that that compile code will execute. And that's something you can see with my tool if you use option I. You see the size of the compiled code and the size of the compressed source code. Again, this is something you can learn about by uh, reading the, the, um, the articles or uh, watching the, the presentations of those uh, researchers. And it's also something that is documented in Microsoft's uh, documentation. And Microsoft will call the compile source code the performance cache uh, data uh, and the source code the compressed source code. So this is a, a representation. Uh, if you have a module stream, you have here your performance cache and here your compressed source code. This is a view of the content of that compressed source code, something you can do with my tool. And here, sorry, that was the uh, compile code. Sorry, there was a compile code. And here you have the view of the compressed source code. Huh? And you key, can see uh, that URL, for example, that is chopped up. Uh, that's uh, because of the compression. But with my tool, you can also do the compression and just see the document. Now, if you have a, a VBA uh, stamped document uh, here, 
what you will do is either alter or suppress the compressed source code here. Like I did in this example, as you can see, the size here is way lower. And if you look at the source code, you just see the name of the module and you don't see the message box. But still, if you open this, enable content, then it will execute. Now, there is a, a particular condition to this. The compiled code is version dependent and architecture dependent. So you need to target the right version of Office and the right version of Windows and do it on the, on the correct architecture and then it will work. If you don't target the right architecture, what will happen then is that the uh, compressed source code will be decompressed compiled into the compile code, and that's then the, uh, what will be executed. Huh? So that was a VBA stomping, uh, something well known. And something uh, that I started to look in, um, if I'm not mistaken, at the beginning of this year, um, no, a bit earlier, but we have written a blog post about this uh, on our uh, Enviso blog in February, if I'm not mistaken, is to do something with the module stream. So as you can alter or suppress the compressed source code, you can also alter or suppress the performance cache. And that's what uh, I'm going to do now here in this example. So we are going to suppress here this code. If you suppress this code, you also have to make an update to the DIR stream because the DIR stream contains module offsets. Eh? These are pointers, eh, integers, that tell you where the uh, compressed source code starts. So, and if you remove the compile code, then your compressed source code will start at zero. And so you have to set those module offsets to zero. And if you do that, and you look with my tool option I, you see here that the compile code there, it's not present, it's zero. And here you have the source code, the compressed source code. And if you take a look at the stream, it doesn't contain, uh, contain um, compile code, only compressed source code. And if you execute this and enable it, then it will run. And this will always run because this is by design. Microsoft uh, made it possible that you don't include uh, compile code. Eh? There are actually a couple of uh, open source tools and also uh, commercial tools that, for example, allow you to create spreadsheets that even contain VBA code, but they cannot, com com uh, they cannot create compile code because that is proprietary. That is not uh, publicly documented by Microsoft. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, you know, VBA uh, stomping was about misleading the analyst and also misleading the antivirus. And here I have a report from uh, Virus Total. And this one here is uh, from the document that was used as a proof of concept, so a real malicious document that was used as a proof of concept by the Walmart team. Uh, so this is a document that they, they used. And as you can see here, yeah, I did my research uh, at the end of December last year, as I can see here. Back then, there were 44 detections, so 44 different antiviruses that detected this. In December, when I did VBA stomping on that document, then only 15 uh, antivirus engines detected it. And that's one of the reasons that you want to do VBA stomping and to lower uh, the chance of detection. Now I'm going to, I have, uh, I'm pointing out two antivirus uh, detections here. So Arcabit and uh, Icarus. They will come back here in the next slide when I did this on a VBA purge document. So this is a document again that I created at the end of December. I took the Walmart document and I did away with the compile code. I removed all the compile code and I only kept the source code. And as you can see, this also lowers uh, the detection rate. It went back to 16 uh, in, uh, in December of 2019. And you actually have, the interesting thing is, you actually have in the detections, Arcabit and Icarus, Icarus that are showing up again. So that means that all of the anti other antiviruses 
don't, well, back then on VirusTotal, eh, did not uh, detect that document here. Hmm? So either they detected the VBA stomp document or either they detected the VBA purge document. Hmm? So VBA stomping and VBA purging is something that you can use if you have to uh, bypass uh, antivirus. Hmm? The only drawback is for VBA stomping is that you have to uh, ad address the right target, uh, choose the right version of your target. Huh? For VBA purging, that's not a problem. Okay, so I talked about suppressing this code. Now let's talk about altering this code. And this is an abuse tip. So we are going to read the manual and uh, abuse this. And we're actually going to abuse uh, the code signing. So this is something that, uh, as far as I know, is, has not been uh, publicly uh, disclosed before. Um, you can uh, tamper with the signature, well, not with the signature, but you can tamper with the code and not invalidate the signature. And that's what I'm going to show here. So if you look at the documentation of Microsoft, you will find contents hashes. So uh, uh, the VBA code, the VBA project inside an office document can have a digital signature and to, uh, to preserve its integrity. And this is, done, this is done like a typical signature would do. They calculate a hash of the content and then they sign that hash. And that hash is called the content hash. Now, an interesting thing, if you look at the pseudo code of the code for that calculates the content hash, in the documentation, you will read this here, modustream.compressed source code. And if you read further, you will not see the uh, performance cache. So this means that for digital signatures in VBA project, by design, Microsoft is only, when it comes to the code, is only taking into account the source code. Uh, so it takes the compressed source code, it decompresses it, as you can see here, and then it uses it to calculate that hash. Mm. Now that's not the only thing, the source code that is taken, also references and module metadata is taken into account. But the compile code is not taken into account. And you can understand where uh, we are going eh, when that compile code is in your what we can do then is take an existing document that is signed, so not one that we sign ourselves, eh? but we take a document that is signed, like this document here, that contains uh, a source code message box hello. And also if we decompile the compiled code, eh, Veselin Bonchev's tool, Pico dump allows us to do it. You see also the uh, sub auto open, hello string, a call to message box. So this displays a message box. While if you take the document that I altered in the source code, again, message box, but in the compiled code, auto open, the string calc, and you see where this is going and shell for that argument. So uh, a typical thing that I'm doing here, I'm launching calculator. So what I did here is alter this document. I have the compressed source code here, message box hello, which is signed. And I have here my compile code, which is not taken into account for the signature. And I've replaced the message box hello with a uh, launch calculator. And if you open this, uh, you get uh, the yellow banner. Uh, so that hasn't changed. And if you have um, your settings at uh, only allow execution of signed code and you enable this, then calculator will be launched. And just for reference, if you open this in a doc, uh, if you open that document that is, has been tampered with, then nothing will execute. Even if you force it, you will get a warning. So this is to illustrate that if you read the, uh, the documents, you, you can arrive at very interesting uh, things. Uh, I, I find this really uh, interesting that I was able to hack this document and, and made uh, a, a small uh, bypass of uh, digital signatures. So here you have an, an overview 
uh, of the different examples that I gave. Uh, and the, these are things that, uh, well, I, I disclosed here. I, I don't think they have been made public. But of course, uh, I'm sure that uh, other actors already know about all of these things uh, because the examples that I gave are actually uh, documented, uh, like the unused bits and the code signing. Uh, if you read the manual, if you take care of reading the manual, yeah, you can find uh, all this uh, information. So these are my four tips. Uh, I gave you examples illustrating these tips. Uh, the, the purpose of these tips is to allow you to grow as, an, um, as a pen tester or, or, or as a red teamer, and, and even more general as a, as a hacker. Uh, observe closely what you are doing, look at others, and read the manual, read the fine manual. Uh, um, I see that I'm just on time, so questions will be for in uh, the, the chat room. If you want more information, here are my blogs, and uh, thank you. Actually, uh, Didier, an amazing job. I want to ask one question. You did get a bunch of questions, and you can do that in the chat, but um, one in particular I thought was good. Uh, first off, somebody said, can they send their documents to you instead of virus total, but I don't think that's an option. <laughs> but the other one is, what process do you use when approaching a file format that's proprietary or minimally documented? Like, how do you go about researching that and understanding it? Well, Google. <laughs> I, start, <laughs> I start out with Google uh, or because, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff on the internet. Eh? And, and if you know how to search, you will find it. Eh? One, one interesting anecdote is the following. Um, you can encrypt Excel spreadsheets and only Excel spreadsheets eh? using a special, um, a special password. And that uh, password is um, Velvet Sweatshop. Okay? And if you encrypt a document with an Excel spreadsheet with Velvet Sweatshop, a uh, recipient can open it and he doesn't have to type the password, okay? So a couple of years ago, I, I discovered a document like this and I could just open it and I didn't understand it. And I had to make a lot of research and searching until I finally found that password, Velvet Sweatshop. And when I looked for Velvet Sweatshop, yeah, then I had a lot of explanations. It's something that is well known, uh, well, back then. Yeah. But uh, Google, that's uh, my first step. But the problem is you have to know exactly what you're looking for. Yeah, those, I mean, fantastic. And I love that you said um, that, uh, you know, the, the people, the bad people already probably know about some of these techniques and, and certainly they do now after your presentation. So <laughs> <it's Yeah. laughs> fantastic stuff, though. Thank you again. I appreciate it. And thanks for staying up with us. You're welcome, Steve. Thank you. Yeah.